Our guest today is Dr. Emily Krauss. Dr. Krauss is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation sports medicine, giving her a unique approach to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of sports injuries. Additionally, she focuses her research on bone health, specifically in runners, and has been doing some incredibly cool multi-year research with the Western States Endurance Run, which was recently published. And even with all of that, Emily still finds time to get outside as an accomplished runner and an avid cyclist, who I feel fortunate to have gotten to share many miles with. Today, we'll be talking about Red S, or Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport, bone stress injuries, and how you, the trail and ultra running community, can stay vigilant when it comes to your health, allowing you to stay on the trail for the long run. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Corinne, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here and truly enjoyed sharing the dirt on both two feet and two wheels with you um, several times. And um, I loved how you enhanced um, the Western States race experience through your animated commentary with Dylan Bowman. And I am really excited to share a conversation with you today. Yeah, I, I feel fortunate that you are such a huge part of our community, both broadly in trail and ultra running, but also here in the Bay Area, um, keeping many of us on our feet. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to kind of talk about some things today kind of in broad strokes, um, we can get nitty gritty. We'll make sure that you're, you'll have to come back on essentially is what I think will end up happening. But today um, I'd really like to talk at least to get started about Red S because I think it's so important. And I think it's something that we're finally starting to get to like, just learn a little bit more about um, more recently um, termed in 2014, kind of becoming part of our normal vocabulary, um, both in athletics at a, at, you know, kind of the general level, but also at the very high level. And so I think many of our listeners will be familiar with terms like the female athlete triad. Again, that being, you know, kind of the, those three pillars of low energy availability, um, menstrual disturbance and low men or low bone mineral density. But I don't feel like that quite paints like a full picture in part like particularly because male athletes are also prone to things like disordered or inadequate fueling um, and bone stress injuries. And so I'm wondering if you can help um, paint a picture for us about Red S and what that means for all of us as athletes, um, independent of sex and gender. Awesome. I think that's a great start. And I would be happy to take a deep dive and try and paint that picture a little, little more clearly um, for, for the um, listeners. Um, I think it can be really confusing to navigate for an endurance athlete, um, all the terminology. And I, I think, especially now with all this information that's being delivered, um, a lot of runners are really eager to learn this information, and I find it fantastic, and I want to support that as best as possible and give them the right information. So um, the concept of low energy availability, which is part of the triad, um, is really at the foundation of the female athlete triad. And that term was um, really originated in the 1980s and was coined in the 1990s. And so there's been a lot of research on the female athlete triad over the last many decades, um, which is great and has really helped support a lot of um, some of the findings that we're seeing now, which affect both males, males and females. And there is a term that um, recently came out called the male athlete triad, um, which is, is similar to the female athlete triad, aside from instead of menstrual disturbances, um, males present with a nice big term called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, um, which is really <laughs> um, involves um, reproductive suppression from that low energy availability state. Um, so back in 2014, like you mentioned, the International Olympic Committee put out a consensus statement on relative energy deficiency in sport, or I'm sure we'll say REDS, we'll say RED S. Um, it's really your, your choice, but um, really it, what it um, captures is it expands further on the triad and those many negative physiological and performance consequences of low energy availability well beyond the reproductive suppression that we see in the triad. So this can include, include effects on metabolism, on thyroid, on um, recovery um, from, from sport and from activity, on the immune system, beyond what we feel um, with, with just the um, regular demands of endurance training, and many other consequences that we're still learning about. And so you can imagine at um, the year of 2014, when this really, um, this idea and this term um, came out into the community that a lot of athletes are confused of, um, is it triad, is it res? And it's really just, um, res is an expansion of um, what's been built um, with the triad. 
And um, we were doing a lot more research and still doing research on both to really understand how best to educate the athlete and really reduce the negative consequences of, of both. And, and really a lot that we're thinking about is, is injury and how can we stay healthy and how can we stay um, on top of our training and not get um, a, a significant devastating, in, devastating injury such as um, a bone stress injury. And um, you, you mentioned as part of the triad that low bone mineral density and um, the consequences of that low bone, bone mineral density over time can be um, a bone stress injury, which is also considered a stress reaction or stress fracture. So that's the, the, the picture that I wanted to start painting, and I'm sure we'll kind of dig some deeper dives into some of those topics, but um, I, I hope that we can kind of set that foundation of understanding so then we can kind of grow from that. Yeah, I think it's so important um, that they've been able to encompass male athletes in this as well, outside of just female athletes in part, because I think, I think it was overlooked for a long time that we assumed that male athletes didn't have, didn't struggle with disordered eating um, or didn't struggle with low, low energy availability. And so I think it's important that we've kind of painted these, these pictures that are both, you know, they're kind of adjacent to one another, but at the same time, they've got a lot of, a lot of overlap. But I think it's, I, um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you off, off air or not, but I actually, I had this like very heated discussion with a good friend recently, um, a physiology friend of mine about, about, um, you know, about REDS or red S um, and low energy availability and eating disorders and kind of like, where is the overlap here? Is there an overlap? Um, and my biggest, like trying to get down to the bottom of this was the idea that, you know, he was in the mindset that almost like red S and disordered eating, um, were almost synonymous, like that you couldn't have one without the other. And I don't like to me, um, you know, sitting here with my physiology hat on and my athlete hat on, um, and taking offense to this in a lot of ways, because we can talk about my own bone stress injury later, um, is that I don't identify as being a person who struggles with disordered eating, but clearly, you know, have some, you know, have some underlying maybe low energy availability. And so I think it's really important to recognize that those two things are separate. And I think it's really interesting. Um, and I'd love to dive into this a little bit deeper about, you know, the risks, I, I think in our sport in particular, right, low energy availability um, we're at a high risk for that, just given the demands of our sport. And so trying to maybe bring awareness um, to our, our listeners about, you know, what, what is low energy availability? What does that look like in their daily life? And, and what are the, you know, obviously there are repercussions of that. Because I think people think, well, I eat enough, I'm safe. But I, I think that that's like a very simplistic view of that topic. Yeah, I think um, I'm so glad you brought that up. And I feel like it's it is an important debate and people can get really um, take things personally if they get categorized into this this red ass diagnosis, especially if they feel like that they're they're fueling properly. And so I think kind of getting back to just definitions, let's talk about what what is energy availability and low energy availability. And so energy availability is defined as the leftover energy availability energy available to support all of an athlete's body functions. So once the energy expenditure of exercise, running, or whatever you do um, is taken away from that energy intake, the energy availability is what's left over. And so low energy availability is when um, that what's left over is too low to maintain your basic kind of physiologic um, the, uh, supplying all the important organs that we need to, to function properly. And so that's when that reproductive suppression um, and those hormones really start to get affected. And that's when some of those other consequences can happen, such as um, in that diagram of red S and, and triad. And so low energy availability can occur from a few different mechanisms. One, it can occur from insufficient energy intake. So this is often in that disordered eating, intentional um, restrictive energy intake um, that can be problematic either through um, just a personal choice or maybe some other body image concerns, um, but, but that is in that disordered eating category as, as, um, as had been discussed. But on the flip side, an athlete may be hitting low energy availability from overtraining or that overreaching. And so I often see this in these transitions. And um, a lot of my work is work seeing, I work with younger athletes in their, in their teenage years. So they may be going from middle school to high school. They may be going from JV to varsity where that training load increases. Then the transition from high school to college, that usually is a volume increase. Then you think about the transition from marathons to ultra marathons. And sometimes um, there is a, a good 
awareness of a fueling and the need to really match those fueling needs. But sometimes even the the best, most educated of athletes with the um, greatest coaching and all the great training plans um, still hit that low energy availability state for too long. And that's when um, the problems arise. And what is really concerning is when those athletes who maybe started with an unintentional low energy availability feel like they're gaining an edge. Maybe they're, um, they feel like they're getting faster um, because they're, they're actually losing weight. And then they start to almost take that to the next level, fly closer and closer to the sun. And, and that's when problems um, really arise um, where they kind of do in, get into more of a chronic energy deficit or chronic low energy availability state. And um, unfortunately, it's only a matter of time when they either get an injury or get significantly fatigued and into this overtrained state where their performance really does take a hit. And that's really where we want to educate the athlete, um, the importance of taking a step back and really looking into um, what, um, what the long-term consequences of, of that is. So I think you, you kind of nailed it that it, um, red S and disordered eating are not synonymous and that there is a spectrum of low energy availability. And there's also a spectrum of disordered eating where um, that may not reach a full-blown um, eating disorder that we diagnose in, um, in a more formal way, uh, but it still um, requires some, some time to really kind of look into that underlying etiology and see if we can reverse some of those, um, those patterns. That's super interesting. And I think uh, my friend's argument, and, and he's a brilliant physiologist, and he's someone that I love to like, you know, go to the mat with and just like have these, have these kind mm -hmm. of heated, but very, you know, practical discussions with. And his, his take was, well, like, even if they aren't, so say they are eating enough, but, or, or you know, it's, it's a, an over, an over, you know, quote unquote, uh, training volume overload. He's like, well, isn't that just um, anorexia athletica? Like, isn't it just like, maybe it's the, that like, is that what they're doing instead of not eating enough? And, you know, yes, there's probably a percentage of the population who that is their, that is, you know, where they mechanistically aren't meeting those energy demands, but it was just super fascinating to try to pick apart these pieces of who, falls into this category. And I think it's really, you know, terrible, but fascinating to think about, you know, these, these long-term consequences as your body's trying to keep you alive, right? Your body's main purpose is to keep you alive. And when you do this thing over and over again, that your body does not feel is, is beneficial that maybe, and, and you get into this chronic depletion state, um, that all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's going to cut the things that it doesn't seem deem necessary. You know, those, those red flags that we've talked about, about like um, menstrual disturbances or um, male, males kind of under these like hormonal fluctuations. Um, so I think it's really interesting that your body's like, nope, don't need that anymore. Red, you know, which is a red flag for us, which I think is important. So it kind of, you know, going from there, how best do we identify that in athletes? How do we look at ourselves as athletes maybe or, or coaches looking at their athletes? Um, particularly in these points of transition where maybe you don't know that athlete super well, um, they're making a jump up in distance. Maybe you're a new coach to them. Maybe, you know, they're, uh, you know, say I'm going from, you know, running on the roads to running my first ultra. How do I identify this potential place? Like how do, how do I see it and say, I don't want to be here. I need to, you know, like course correct. What does that look like? Yeah, I think um, you raise a lot of different good, great points. And I feel like we could take some deep dives into a lot of that as far as even the relationship with exercise and over-exercising and, and what um, what we're doing when we're going out and doing those long runs and that training, is that and is that the right approach? And I think especially in the ultra running um, population, there is there is that slippery slope of, of really kind of craving and almost an addiction to this sport in a way that's um, unique and different than maybe um, what we experience in other sports. And I will say those endorphins and that feeling of running in that community and in the trails is, is really powerful, but it can, um, it can be, can take, take over. And it's important to really um, have that healthy relationship with sport. Um, but back to your question, as far as um, how do we identify this, um, this low energy availability state, or how do we um, prevent that um, to kind of get to that point? And 
um, I think it, it's it's challenging because that's unique and it can manifest or present itself in a lot of different ways and differently in different athletes and different sports and males versus females, which is why um, it's important to study that difference um, in research and why there's a push to really close that gap in understanding um, how reds um, manifest in um, a male athlete versus a female athlete. But in women, it's a little bit more straightforward. Um, it can look like the triad with reproductive suppression. So that could be a change in menstrual cycle where an athlete may completely lose her period. And we see that a lot, especially in those high school athletes where they don't fully have that understanding and understand understand that the period is cool and you want to have it every month. And that's an important marker that your, your body is, is um, functioning at its um, prime. Um, but it also can be just a, a lighter flow or just maybe a little bit of an abnormality in the cycle. And so that get, gets a little bit more nuanced. And the reality is when an athlete loses her period, that's probably a little bit more extreme in that energy suppression or that low energy availability state as far as how long it's been going on. So ideally, we're catching that, catching that earlier. Um, but then in men who don't have periods, um, they may see other uh, manifestations or a different presentation of that um, of that uh, low energy availability. And so that could be um, a decrease in sex drive or a decrease in libido. And women can experience this too, by the way, this is just a male thing. And um, they also um, could present with a loss of morning erections and, and um, high school males, um, that is that is that should be expected. And so that is something that we do ask in our clinic. And um, some other presentations that are out of that um, reproductive sex hormone category include um, fatigue. So fatigue despite feeling adequately rested, maybe taking another day or two off, um, maybe a plateau in overall performance, um, despite having a killer coach with a great training plan. Um, there are other um, blood blood levels that can be um, there could be other bl blood levels that can be suppressed if, if you do have um, access to, um, to get lab draws or lab work done. So this could be thyroid suppression. This could be um, sex hormone suppression, like I was describing kind of more of those physical signs. You can also see those lab signs as well. Um, and then if it gets to the extreme, there can be weight changes or a, a decrease in weight, but it doesn't have to be. Um, sometimes the body is adjusting and acclimating and already dropping or decreasing the metabolism. So an athlete may not notice this uh, extreme um, weight loss or a change in, in weight, um, but their metabolism slows, which is not good for overall performance or just overall um, health and body functioning. So I think those are kind of the heavy hitters and the, the ones towards the end are way less specific and they could be from a lot of different things. So sometimes an athlete will just um, attribute it to another cause um, and maybe be misdiagnosed and where they actually, and maybe they'll be even placed on a medication. Sometimes athletes will be placed on thyroid replacement when it's actually um, REDS um, that's that's presenting. Yeah, or placed on, I'm placed on birth control. I feel like that's been, that was like a, very popular thing when I was in high school was, oh, you're not getting, you're not menstruating. Well, we can put you on birth control and that will, that will give you a period. And I feel like we are moving away from that slowly, at least in, in broad strokes. But I know that that has been a very common treatment amongst young athletic women. And I think that that is, I mean, I am, I am hoping desperately that that information is being presented now to physicians and, and clinicians and um, and to the athletic population and coaches, because what a what a thing to miss, right? To to artificially trigger this and not actually and put a band aid on it instead of actually identifying what's going on. Like that to me is so scary in retrospect. Totally, and it's still happening. I mean, I, Corinne, I mean, you just graduated a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> I mean, it was just <laughs> just yesterday you were in high school. <laughs> Right. But it's but it's still happening. I still have high school athletes who come in and say, oh, my coach told me to be um, to start birth control pills because I, I lost my period during training or or my 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 doctor did. And, and so there's a lot of education that needs to happen at even at that basic level. And, and it just, it really, I mean, it breaks my heart when I have an athlete who, who thinks that one is maybe a rite of passage to, to lose their period during, um, during a sport, um, which is, was this idea that um, you're not training hard enough or you're not pushing your body hard enough if you haven't lost your period. And that's, that's not true and that's false. And um, I think I'm trying to really hard shift that, that, um, 
that culture into realizing that fueling your body properly is is cool and it's important and it's important for longevity in sports and it's important to build your bones. Um, those high school athletes need to be building their bones um, to set them up for life. And hormone replacement, there is a time and a place for it, but um, missed periods due to low energy availability is not one of them. Yeah, I I, I am baffled and scared that that, that narrative still exists um, amongst, um, amongst, you know, athletes right now. And I, I see it, you know, routinely in my Instagram feed of people being like, I used to think this was a badge of honor. I used to think that this was, you know, such a, you know, it was good that, that, that this had happened to me. And I'm happy that this message is getting out there and that, um, you know, physicians like yourself are kind of championing it. And then athletes as well are, are leading by example and saying, Hey, like, you don't, you know, this is, this is not, not the way, but then, you know, so we've put athletes on birth control sometimes or have, have historically to try to give them their period. But what about, um, this is kind of tangential a little bit, but what about um, athletes? So we're talking about canary in the coal mines, right? Like you, if you've lost your period, that's a bad sign, generally speaking. And it's kind of like, that's a end of the road, not end of the road, but it's, it's a, it's a late stage bad sign. So what about athletes who, the 20, let's say the 20% of women who are on like Mirena, so a hormonal IUD, who generally lose the bleeding portion of their period. That doesn't mean that they don't have a cycle, but what, you know, if they're not getting that, that bleed every month, what are, what can they look towards, you know, besides just keeping logs um, to know, to know that hopefully they are still, you know, having some sort of natural cycle. Yeah. That's a great question, and I wish I had a really easy, well-defined, well-researched answer to that. Um, I think that there is a lot of um, it's it's convenient. Um, the IUD and the marina is, is a convenient method of um, of, of contraception, um, but there is you do, it does eliminate that convenience of knowing that regularity of of the menstrual cycle, and so instead, I think that sometimes females still go through, um, sometimes they'll still have spotting with the marina and so that there is that, that indicator, but some there, they lose, um, bleeding altogether. And so it's, it's a little bit variable based, um, from, from athlete to athlete, patient to patient. But I also think that sometimes you can also feel those other, um, physical manifestations of, um, the menstrual cycle and the different stages, which can still take place. So I think that's a good indicator if you're still having something like that crampy, those crampy s- symptoms, the bloating, and so if those are eliminated or you almost kind of feel um, even just a little bit more neutral throughout the month, that might be a, a sign of, of something being off and kind of back to that whole, um, like the lack of libido and the lack of, of sex drive, those, those natural fluctuations of hormones circulating throughout your body. Um, if those are being suppressed overall, there may be this kind of suppression in, in, in mood, which could manifest as fatigue or apathy. Um, but again, it's so nonspecific that it's hard to just pinpoint and say, oh, this is related to my fueling. But if you kind of go back and you kind of look at your, your log, you may notice as far as your refueling strategies or even just um, training hours and hours out on the trails, um, during that time, you are going to hit an energy deficit and you are going to be low. But that refueling that day and even the days after that are super important despite whether or not you feel like you need, um, you feel hungry and you feel like you need to refuel. It's just getting into those those habits and, and really either like being a good learner or being um, an kind of seeking out those resources, um, whether that is meeting with a, a registered dietitian to just calculate those those needs and those particular specific needs for you, or working with a coach to really come up with that fueling plan from the beginning and practice that from the beginning so um, you don't run into those issues um, down, the, down the road. That's so, that's so interesting. I think you we kind of just grazed a very important topic, particularly for trail and ultra runners. I, like I know specifically for me, when I'm at altitude, I need more calories. Um, I intentionally take in some more calories, generally like a second dinner, kind of a snack before mm-hmm. bed, um, post dessert snack before bed. Um, and what I see in, in athletes that I coach and in myself is that I go for big long runs on the weekend and then I have a rest day on Monday. And I think it's really easy to potentially fall into this, like, you know, this glitch where it's like, well, I'm not training today, so I don't need to eat as much. So can you talk a little bit? I know in research, this is oftentimes termed like, day-to-day energy availability or even interday energy availability? Like how, how can we think about that as 
as runners and coaches, as far as like making sure we're adequately fueled, even in those micro kind of those micro, those days in between. Yeah, I think um, it's so easy, especially when we talk about altitude, um, not just even like the whole overall under just under fueling or not meeting those demands that um, altitude puts on your body, but also even just talking about iron levels and talking about iron deficiency and those additional iron needs to kind of give your red blood cells, that hemoglobin, that extra capacity to deliver, deliver that oxygen. And um, we also see, so in addition to like planning ahead, like you said, with um, just making sure that you incorporate the additional snacks, you double, I mean, you really need to add in and kind of make sure that meal is, is really timed well post post training efforts even when the appetite is suppressed because i think that's another challenge is after you do those hard long efforts um, whether and also with altitude and and just a lot of components of, of the type of training that that an ultra marathoner is doing um the there isn't this hunger to to really kind of fill up the that plate with um really healthy healthy meals so i think one strategy would be to break it up more Make sure that you, right after that training, you get something in the system. Maybe it's a, a, a really good, um, well-rounded smoothie um, with a good kind of carbohydrate protein ratio. Um, and then after that, have that good full meal, that hearty meal um, later on when maybe your stomach is a bit more, can tolerate that. Um, but then adding in those additional snacks too. And and really that that rest day is not a day to, to, to really deprive the body. I mean, that's the day when the refuel, recover, I mean, that's the importance of the rest day. So um, taking advantage of that um, rest day and refuel day and, and use that to, to set you up for the rest of the week. So that way you're not going into this um, glycogen depletion into that next round of training. And I think that's where athletes really um, maybe miss the mark a little bit. And it may present in different ways where it's just they feel like they're not responding to their training. They're maybe um, a little bit um, under maybe not hitting the marks as far as the either the distance or the time um, or just or it could be an injury and it may not be a bone stress injury at that point it could be another another cranky nagging injury that 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 comes up so so take factoring those those pieces in whether it is um going out to altitude for a weekend even if it is just a weekend or long weekend um take that into account and make sure that rest of the week when you return back from the mountains that you're thinking about um how you um, address that deficit that was this past weekend. Yeah, I I like the the refuel day. I think I'm going to add that into all of my athletes' training plans from here on out. It's not going to say recovery day. It's going to say recovery and refuel day because I think that is so important to stress to stress that because a lot of us do come out of those weekends in just a huge caloric hole, and that doesn't set us up well for for training. It doesn't set us up well for recovery. So. I, I like that refuel day is going into everyone's training peaks Woo-hoo! from here on out, <laughs> which is great. Okay. <clears throat> so switching gears just a smidge. Um, I'd love to talk more about the research that you all were able to publish recently. For those of you that don't know, um, Emily and her team just finished up collecting data on their third year of research with the Western States Endurance Round, which is so exciting to have this big longitudinal or just like multi-year data collection um, on trail and ultra runners, because we are a group of athletes who do not get researched all that often. And, you know, it's hard for clinicians um, and physicians like yourself to, you know, figure out what to do with us because there isn't data out there on us. So I'm really excited. And I would love to hear um, more about what you guys have found so far, and this is really diving into that bone stress injuries and kind of risk factors for bone stress injuries and risk factors for, you know, male and female um, athlete triad. I just, you know, I would love for you to give you know us a synopsis of what that research has looked like, and then we can kind of just dig into it from there. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thank you. Um, our team was really honored to be given the opportunity to do research for three years, almost consecutive. And the Kind of COVID year doesn't really count, but 2018, 2019, and 2021, we were um, conducting research. Um, and thanks to funding from the, from the Western States Research Foundation, which is a, a phenomenal foundation, and big shout out to the board. And um, they've been funding research for decades. And a lot of the research and those articles that are published out there are from studies on Western States runners. And so 
thank you to all of the runners who continue to participate and sign up despite a lot of other distractions that can happen during um, a race weekend. The fact that they're willing to do that helps contribute to the sport science. And also, I want to give a big shout out to doctor, runner, researcher, podcaster, Megan Roach, who has been involved with this um, research from the beginning as well. And has been, she's such a hard worker and um, it's, she's also a joy to do research with and just, um, you know, an, insp an inspiration in, in and of herself. So back to the, the science. So our goal with this research was to explore um, the occurrence or how often um, triad, um, female and male triad risk factors occur in ultra marathon runners. So um, we wanted to just look at that as um, potential determinants of overall bone health. And we also looked at other associations between sex hormones and bone mineral density, and also looked at genetic risk factors the last couple of years. So um, each year, the runners would um, get contacted and recruited months before. They would, um, if they agreed, they would fill out an online survey and then um, reg or sign up for um, a bone mineral density scan um, on site at um, Olympic Valley um, in the days leading up to the event when they arrived. Just as um, when they arrived to um, to the Olympic Valley, and they would get their DEXA, and so the DEXA stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry, which is our one of our measurements of, of bone health. And then we would get um, lab draws, um, which um, thanks to Inside Tracker, we were able to get a phlebotomist on site for the last um, two races. And um, we got um, different sex hormone levels, including um, free and total testosterone. We got um, a measure of iron um, through a measure of um, ferritin and then estradiol. And then we also got um, vitamin D. And then um, the third part, um, which we did for the last two years, was we um, did genetic tests through a company called Axgen, and we looked at different markers for low bone mineral density and gen genetic markers for low bone mineral density and um, bone stress injury um, risk. So we got all that information, and um, we thankfully got um, a some preliminary data published in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine, which just um, got published right after the, the most recent um, Western states. I was really hoping that it would get published before so that we could um, print out a bunch of them and just hand it out like candy, <laughs> like do some light reading before you go to bed. Um, so, But we did not. It was um, shortly after. And so we presented those findings um, in the paper. And um, we had 40 women and 83 men participate in the first two years, which is great. Um, and it's about one fifth of the racing field. And given the extent and how much um, was involved with the race participation, I, um, I find that a fantastic number. And the ratio of women to men is pretty um, pretty um, similar to what the um, ratio in the in actual um, Western states um, is. So we found that about one third of women in our study had a history of stress fractures, which is about 37.5%. And one fifth of men at about 20.5% had history of bone stress injury. And the overall um, prevalence that's been um, reported is about 25% of ultra marathon runners. Um, so our, our females actually had a higher overall number than the um, kind of overall um, prevalence of, of bone stress injuries. And that's a higher number than um, what we see even in the um, high school and collegiate um, athletes. And the question is, you know, over the so many years of running, does that just kind of accumulate your overall um, kind of risk and your number of years to sustain a bone stress injury? And it's, it's possible. But one of the findings that I found really interesting was the number of athletes um, trying to lose weight for performance. So one of the questions in our survey was, um, are you trying to lose weight for performance? And over 50% of women and 46% of men um, reported, yes, that they are trying to lose weight for performance. And it kind of goes back to that question of um, with low energy availability and disordered eating. You know, I think there is that spectrum um, where it's it's okay to try to try to lose weight for performance, but there are a lot of methods and um, healthy methods and unhealthy methods to get to that point. And unfortunately, without either through kind of a lack of education or a lack of help and support or the resources, an athlete can very easily slip into those un unhealthy habits and slip into um, that low energy availability state. And some of the other questions that we asked were a little bit more um, probing as far as some of those disordered eating um, patterns. And so we found that two thirds of females and about 45% of males, um, based on our um, kind of screening process, 
um, were at moderate or high risk for disordered eating. And so it kind of goes back to that um, bigger issue as far as um, the education and and really getting um, back into maybe even just a bit of the why um, some of those questions were answered how they were. And there are limitations with um, an online survey, um, but I do think that this, because this was anonymous, that um, these were their, their true answers. But again, it's, it's a survey and these, are, these questions are validated, but does it really dive into um, some of the questions that we're try, trying to get to? And, and I think we're still working through like the right questions for the right athletes. And one of the other interesting findings was looking at just overall sex hormones. So we got testosterone and estrogen, estrogen levels in both males and females. And we actually looked at that relationship as it relates to their bone health um, with bone mineral density. And we found that the higher sex hormone levels, so the higher um, testosterone, and yes, women do have testosterone levels, just at a lower, lower level than, than males, um, that the, the higher the sex hormone levels, the higher the bone mineral density in, in female, um, female ultramarathon runners. So it kind of goes back to that point of finding ways to optimizing your hormone levels circulating throughout your body to make sure to enable your bones to um, remodel and reproduce and kind of be their best versions of themselves at each decade of your life. And especially as we're building birthdays and kind of getting into that um, osteoporosis or excuse me, that menopausal time um, later on. Um, hopefully, I'm talking to Corinne and I, we're, we're, we still got some, some time there, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but with the ultra marathon population, there's a spectrum as far as, as far as age. Um, that do um, participate in these races. And they, they, we, do, we did have some women in that um, perimenopausal time. And so taking that into account, um, doing everything that you can to optimize those levels um, for as long as possible is going to be really important. And um, we're still um, fully trying to understand um, what we can do to optimize bone health in this um, highly active population. But I got to say, um, I had a really fun conversation with um, Dr. Anthony, Dr. Tony Hackney, who's um, this hormone physiologist at um, the University of North Carolina, and he's done a lot of work on um, kind of hormonal suppression and especially in, in athletes of all, all sports, but especially in, in endurance sports as well. And, and we, we just talked about this, this need to really understand the, the, the ultra runner and what are like, are there different, um, is there, are there things that have allowed that athlete to, to, to be a bit more resilient to, to injury, to get, to get them to that start line, especially Western states. And I, I do think that there are some either protective factors within the training, within genetics that, that did allow that athlete to, to get there. And, and I think we're, we're still trying to understand it through these questions, through these um, hormonal profiles. And um, we're still trying to analyze the data from this past year, but um, I'm excited to be able to present that and, and see if we can um, get a little bit of an understanding as far as um, what, are the, what is the unique risk profile for, for an ultra runner. So that way we can um, provide that the proper education for you all. That's so interesting. And I think it's, I feel like research Generally speaking, if you've formatted a good, if you've if you have formed a good research question and you are collecting the right data, the answers are almost like well duh, like this is what we think. Like it's you know it's kind of like it's it's not to say it's common sense, but we're like oh of course this is what we found, and I think it's really interesting that you know there's a almost a fifty fifty percent chance of these of these runners having some sort of disordered eating or high risk for it, almost a fifty fifty chance of having a history with stress fractures and. Um, you know, and a 50, 50 chance of those factors potentially playing into, or, you know, chicken or the egg here, um, these hormone levels. And I just think that's so fascinating. And I do, um, correct me if I'm wrong. What was the bone for bone density who had, and I mean, I think it was kind of, it was split, but who had males versus females in the, in the study? Um, what was the bone density like for those athletes as well? Oh, great question. I, I glossed over that. I want to make sure I give the right, the right numbers. It's so bad that I, um, somebody gave me a hard time. Jason Coop gave me a hard time. He's like, you have to look Jason up data be for time. your own research. And I'm like, yes, I don't want to misquote myself in this. That's be really embarrassing. Yeah, okay. Don't misquote yourself. <laughs> so as far as, so this was another interesting piece. Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, for bone mineral density, um, we kind of broke that down into low, moderate, and high risk. And so we were using this um, female athlete coalition um, cumulative risk assessment tool to help um, break down low, moderate, and high risk. But in females, 
only about 20% were um, at moderate or high risk for low bone mineral density compared to about 35% of males. So males had lower bone mineral density. They had less stress fracture risk, but not, not terrible. Um, and the question is just about one, like what's the breakdown as far as um, what bone mineral density markers do we need to give as far as um, safe or unsafe for a male runner versus a female runner? Two, we may be underpowered with this group to really say that um, males had crappier bone mineral density than, than females. But is there, is there also a protective factor with that? If females had worse bone mineral density, would we be seeing a stronger? We actually didn't see as strong of a correlation with um, bone stress injury and um, bone mineral density in, in the males and females. But it's, it's an interesting point. And um, some of the questions as far as genetic risk, and um, we did see some, correla some relationships between genetic risk for bone mineral density and low bone mineral density in males but we did not see that relationship with females. And um, I think our question is, are there, are there other factors that are contributing to that relationship between bone mineral density that's just beyond the genetic piece? So are females more susceptible to those environmental factors like low energy availability and, low, and that, are they more sensitive to those changes and those hormonal changes than, than, a, than a male? And well, can that almost change their trajectory as far as their genetic risk profile. And that's so interesting. Yeah. That's I, still figuring I just, it I out. It, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, we've got so much more research to do and which I think makes this very, very exciting. And I think, you know, there's probably something there with, with hormonal or like sensitivity to hormonal changes, maybe with female athletes compared to male athletes, just because I feel like not to say that we are definitely not delicate by any means, no. but you know, it seems like female athletes in general are more susceptible to to negative consequences of specific diets or of under fueling. It seems that there's a protective factor maybe, or, or testosterone in general is just less, um, less, um, I don't know, susceptible to those like, mo like small changes mm -hmm. maybe as opposed to, to female sex hormones. Um, but maybe, you know, hopefully. Yeah. Well, we'll I mean, we there. think about the menstrual cycle too. So there are those fluctuations that are just, um, we just, we don't see in a, in a, in a male. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, I hope that this actually, that we can from this get this, you know, kind of a risk, a risk profile that could be a tool for, for athletes, for coaches. You know, I am a person who has had to come see you in your office, um, which is hilarious too, because for those of you who don't know, Dr. Krauss works out of a, a, a pediatric ortho office. And so when I checked in, they asked who the patient was and I was like, I'm, I'm the patient. And they asked my birthday and I was like, 1990. And they were like, are you sure? I was like, yep. I'm here. Um, so I do think that this becoming a tool for athletes and coaches could be really promising. Um, because, you know, when I look at, when I look at Red S in general, I don't see myself in that data very clearly, but you know, this winter got myself a really fancy, you know, bone stress injury in, in a big bone too. And a big bone that, you know, I think raises a lot of red flags as far as something must be going on and talking to folks too. It just, it turns out it takes a lot of energy to, to lay down bone over and over and over again in our sport, you know, I've, I don't know how many steps I've put in, into my legs over the last, you know, six years being an ultra runner. But I think that there are, you know, I think that having a, a risk factor tool that we can, you know, we can, an, we can ask these questions, answer these questions honestly, um, could be really helpful for, for many of us, which I think would be just a wonderful thing to come out of you know, three years of three years and much more research to come, I'm sure. Yes. Yes. We're working on it, Corinne. It's <laughs> work in progress. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure to solve bone stress injuries for ultra runners, but I would appreciate it immensely. Um, and I, I would like to dive into this deeper and deeper with you, but I'm going to let, I'm going to, we're going to, we'll, we'll wrap up for today so that we can let you get back to your office and your patients who I'm sure are, are patiently waiting for you. And so that no one in your office, you know, gives me a hard time down the road either when I ask for more of your time. But I'd like to, we're going to sum it up here. And I've got one last question for you. So, so big picture takeaways for everyone listening at home. We talked about Red S today, um, you know, really being cognizant of your energy availability and looking out for factors that any of us can track, you know, that, that being menstrual um, abnormalities or for men, you know, things like morning erections, um, 
you know, being care like being cognizant of fatigue, you know, a journal or an app that you can log this stuff in would be very, very beneficial. And then be smart and thoughtful when it comes to, you know, like snacks in times of higher energy demand and using those refuel days to hopefully catch up after big, long efforts. Um, and then obviously fantastic to hear about all the research that you're doing um, with ultra runners because it is so, so important. And we will look for more publications to come for your team down the road. So our listeners are hopefully students of the sport. And I want to know if there is one piece of advice you wish you could pass on to young and old athletes alike so that they do not end up in your office like me, what would that be? Just one? <laughs> just, just one. Just one for today. We'll have you back okay, on. And, okay. And all right. One. All right. Um, so to keep with the theme, I think um, fuel is your friend. Kind of use, think about it as fuel. Think about it as fueling you for performance, fueling you for reducing that that injury risk, fueling for, for life. Um, kind of think about all these other life stressors, um, whether it's um, traveling to altitude or, or just um, kind of surviving a, a stressful week. Um, think about that food as fuel and, and fuel off, and especially as your training ramps up. Awesome. What wonderful advice that we can all heed. We made brownies last night. I'm excited to go have more brownies later. Um, Dr. Emily Krauss, thank you so much for your time today and your and your willingness to share your knowledge with all of us. Um, anyone who's listening to this, volunteer to be a test subject at future ultras. Um, researchers like Dr. Krauss and her team need us to be their guinea pigs. Um, with that, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. And I hope I get to ride a bike or run with you soon. Yes, me too. Thank you, Corinne. And, and yes, thanks for the shameless plug for more research subjects. <laughs>